I'll be revisiting talking about the Gather 2030 initiative and a little bit about Maggie Braun here and the advocation for direct democracy and where a system of direct democracy takes us as well as a little bit about Web3 governance and what that is. So it says here James McNair and Partap Dua shared their vision of returning democracy to the hands of the people through the Federal Direct Democracy Party and preparing his party for upcoming elections. James McNair also shared the not-for-profit initiative under Direct Democracy to quickly build tiny homes for all Canadians in need. Kellyanne Wolf and Jody Ledger were to ask who's the boss and spoke to the importance of running independent candidates across the country alongside the Direct Democracy Party. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, direct Democracy is different from a representative democracy and how they'll define a representative democracy, which is Canada, I guess, from the position of textbooks anyway, is that you have elected officials, which I call selected officials, and people vote on different initiatives put out by their representatives, whereas with a direct democracy, it's the people who decide on the policies where the citizens more like act as part of the governing structure instead of these representatives, if you will, right? But when you factor in Web3 governance and, you know, being, being that a direct democracy has pretty much everybody involved, you have to turn around and vote on absolutely everything. So you're not really slowing down any sort of bureaucratic process. You're only making things actually take that much longer. And to, in order to keep track of everybody, uh, especially in a large nation like Canada, you would need some kind of electronic system, which could be rigged very simply and easily. And I understand that this kind of direct democracy is actually quite similar to Switzerland's system. And this is just an opinion I want to give, but I think a large portion of people in Switzerland trust their government over that of the citizens in Canada. So what I'm saying is just, it's almost like a normalized thing that people are being part of a system and feel like they're building something, but the reality is it can be rigged just as easily as a quote-unquote representative democracy because all these people that are always put into these places of power always seem to be selected related to somebody important in history or a Freemason or something of the above, right? So it says here our Parliamentary representative democracy political system is set up to give absolute power to our PM. We do not elect our PM. He is appointed by the Governor General on behalf of our Queen. Our PM, whom we do not elect, appoints the Cabinet. We do not elect all the most powerful people in our government. Our House of Commons is supposed to represent us, the people, but we have failed. The House of Commons represents the interests of ruling party of the ruling party rather than the interests of the people of Canada. This applies to most institutions, including the, the judiciary as judges, are appointed by the parties in power. So it also says here that it's become obvious that our governments do not represent us and do not follow the will of the people while we have a de facto government here. What do you want? These past two years have shown that they have crossed the line in trampling our Constitution and our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Our Constitution and Charter of Rights and Freedoms are meaningless when our governments no longer govern according to them. Well, what piece of legislation in history was ever actually built for we the people? And when you really factor in Section 1 of the Charter, which is all you really need to read, is that your rights are subject to reasonable limitation. And when they're referring to your rights, they're talking about something commercial. They're not talking about your natural rights to live, eat, drink water, and that kind of a thing whatsoever. It's all a commercial game to these people. And the Charter is something that was again never built for us because you look at section one and you can just alter what people's rights really are at any given moment and who deems these things 
to actually um, who actually makes the final decision in these things judges jury whatever like I mean it's all fixed anyway so yeah this is the direct democracy party here and it makes reference to Switzerland like I was saying because Switzerland has a has a direct democracy of sorts from my understanding so this is one of the leaders here of the Dem direct democracy party James McNair in Ottawa as the new co-leader of Canada's fourth front party I am here to fight all ca fight for all Canadians by representing by presenting an alternative to the big parties our economic plan will protect Canadians from rising costs of living create jobs in construction renewable energy health care and agriculture Canadians have had a long hard fight as those around the world during this specific thing that I can't say the name of unfortunately this scam we believe in investigating in Canadian business and public infrastructure to ensure a society that looks out for all Canadians Canadians deserve to be in control of our own democracy in 2015 when Trudeau spoke about proportional representation Canadians listened however as with previous governments who campaigned on electoral reform the initiative was dropped not long after that election we believe that Canadians should speak for themselves and be empowered by a directed democracy system Canada's fourth front is a collaboration of grassroots Canadians from all walks of life we believe in building bridges and working for reconciliation with communities who have been harmed by past governments our candidates stand for the rights of all Canadians who will reach a stronger connection with their constituents by setting up a digital direct democracy infrastructure there you go this digital voting system will give Canadians the power to send their votes directly and easily to their representatives let's build a better Canada well okay I know what the voting machines do and again with a large electronic system it's not hard to have people change votes and that sort of a thing and also to the comment here let's build a better Canada sounds a whole lot like build back better which is a phrase of the World Economic Forum and organizations like that that are on board the sustainable development agenda and when you set up like this digital voting system um, basically like I said people are selected not elected so this just sets up a digital infrastructure for organizations like the WEF to have which is just the prerequisite for a social credit system and it's really the illusion of a democratic system as you feel you're making these choices but really when those votes when those votes are really changed or rigged and just because you feel like you are involved in the decision making process because of more direct involvement with a direct democracy this is not synonymous with freedom nor is the term democracy in and of itself actually equivalent to that of freedom democracy just kinda of means everybody has a say and everybody is involved but if everybody is told what to think and what to say and what is socially acceptable and not how do you really have any sense of freedom and then tack on subliminal messaging and advertisements and that kind of a thing right and what do you have you have a society that is manipulated and not really truly free by any way shape or form so yeah there isn't really a foolproof system like direct or representative democracy but Plato always thought about a democracy as the final step prior to tyranny because in his view before I continue I just want to explain this you have an aristocracy which is where a small group of people make the decisions and then from there you have a democracy which is kind of like an Alexander the Great kind of a thing you know you conquer you conquer lands and things and basically take what it is you conquered and then from there you have an oligarchy which is where the rich are the ruling are the ruling class and then from there when everybody complains they all want to stay in the rich are ruling then you have a democracy and then once everybody you know has the illusion of freedom like they all get the chance to speak or whatever while they're being manipulated in subtle ways and their subconscious being manipulated on various levels then eventually you 
delve toward a tyranny is what happens of sorts. So whether that looks like something of fascism or communism, it really doesn't matter while there are subtle differences between the two, people die either way. So here is this article from 2016, I think I showed in my previous video, what they're calling electronic IDs, which I'll just refer to as digital ID by 2030. It says, fortunately, help is on its way. The United Nations and the World Bank have a goal to deploy electronic IDs for all humanity by, uh, by 2030. With electronic identities, one can easily verify the person who's on the Internet and have confirmed identity and therefore eventually support the freedom of assembly on the Internet. And then following it, we will also hopefully be able to form Internet democracy. But what kind of democracy should the Internet follow? The Internet does not have the size and distance limitations that require representative democracy. On the other hand, everyone voting on everything all the time, although technically possible, is not practical. So which way should the Internet go? And it says direct plus representative democracy, which they call a delegative democracy. This is a new form of democracy emerging now on the Internet, which is a hybrid of representative and direct democracy, in which people can either vote directly or delegate their vote to someone else that they trust. Vote delegation can be once or ongoing and can always be revoked or overwritten. There is your social credit score right there. It requires very complex software and algorithms to do it, but what's the internet for if not for that? So, yeah, and this is again a, a perfect image to describe exactly that. So imagine everybody being allowed to partake provided their privileges are not revoked, then you basically just have another form of tyranny under the guise of what they call delegative democracy, which is some weird fusion of direct and representative democracy. So that seems to be a direction that they're heading and it seems like with the Gather 2030 initiative pushing direct democracy unless that's changed of course it seems like they are setting up the platform for organizations like the WEF or the UN or the UN to actually be able to implement their plans because with a direct democracy you can streamline to a tyranny really really easily so Basically, now I'm going to be talking about Web3 governance and what that is, and it's basically the next generation of the Internet. It's a term that's been thrown around. It refers to the next iteration of the Internet and aims to reduce dependency on large tech companies like YouTube, Netflix, and Amazon, so they say. So, basically, Web3 governance is like the blockchain being implemented, right? Whereas when you look at what Web 1 was, Web 1 is the, these are all iterations of what the Internet was. So Web 1 is pretty much just like looking at articles and stuff like that. You couldn't really do a whole lot. And then by the time Web 2 came around, it's what they describe as a read-write version of the Internet in reference to computer code. This version of the Internet allowed people to not only consume content but to create their own and put up blogs like Tumblr, and for people that grew up in the 90s, very early form of this would be Newgrounds.com. And then you've got social media like Facebook and stuff like that. So it's kind of like basically creating your own content to be placed on the internet, if you will. And so there was more interactivity, if you will, with Web 2. And then by the time you get to Web 3... It's kind of, well, to me, it's like the, uh, they call it decentralized, but the blockchain is kind of like a ledger system. And to my knowledge, you can't erase anything that's placed on the blockchain unless maybe you're some kind of programmer or something. But I don't know the, the limitations and that sort of a thing because that's not my area of expertise. But to my understanding, you can't remove anything that's used through blockchain technology and it's like a giant ledger system where everything is recorded so while they call it decentralized there isn't really a sense of privacy um, from my understanding so rather than 
using free tech platforms in exchange for our data, users can participate in the governance and operation of the protocols themselves. So once again, this is very similar to the illusion of direct democracy. In Web3, these shares are called tokens or cryptocurrencies, and they represent ownership of, a decentralized, of decentralized networks known as blockchains. So as far as I'm concerned, again, nothing is really private. It can always be monitored unless, I don't know, you build some kind of computer with like a Faraday cage on it or something like that. But I'm no expert in that department. So yeah, it says holders of governance tokens can spend their assets to vote on the future of, say, a decentralized lending protocol. Yeah, exactly. And then you have NFTs and different kinds of cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, that sort of a thing. So, yeah, Web3 governance is something that plays directly hand in hand with a direct democracy type of platform, if you will, or rather what the WEF called delegative democracy as they're kind of creating their own sort of hybrid between direct democracy and represented sorry it's like a hybrid between representative democracy and direct democracy where the illusion of everybody having a say is prominent but whether someone can actually partake in that system or not would be subject to different limitations and of course again it's not hard to implement a kind of social credit system using a direct democracy where everybody is digitally making decisions and that kind of a thing or digitally have the illusion of making decisions and being involved with the system so and this is an article here where they actually talk about the like a rewards system for it and so with a reward system again this is just very much this article here kind of analyzes the pros and cons of a of a of web3 governance that kind of a thing and so they do kind of touch on a little bit of how it could turn into a social credit score but this article is fairly vanilla and is largely an opinion based piece but it says here a core puzzle for democratizing dem democratizing online governance systems is understanding how to incentivize long-term civic participation via rewards current web3 governance systems tend to use transferable tokens but those have some clear limitations such as tendency toward plutocracy low uh, civil resilience and incentives to sell tokens and exit which might be overcome by moving beyond coin voting in this article I compare the trade-offs of reputation based and token based reward systems for participation in governance I outline considerations for each of these governance reward systems and discuss how they might be earned and what powers they might translate into so it's interesting because Typically speaking, decisions, politically speaking, seem to be wealth-based, not always merit-based. And again, that's not always the case. But if they want to switch something into something more merit-based, if you will, again, that's pushing the direction of a social credit system once again. And so while people have the option to sell their uh, their stakes and investments in things like cryptocurrencies and and acquire our fiat currency as a result of that that won't be an option all the time in history because all fiat currencies have always collapsed in history and I'm not sure which Chinese dynasty it was that actually brought forth the fiat currency but it wasn't long after that the Venetians brought forth a fiat currency which was eventually backed by gold but the thing is many people were bringing their gold into the banks 
and exchanging them for banknotes, which then people got so used to using banknotes and the banks just stole people's gold. So that's how that situation went down. And now this over here is Jean Belfort. The reason why I'm bringing up this particular article and people can have a look themselves as to what this civil society thing is here he has, but it seems like Maggie Braun seemed to favor this article, so I don't know if this is some sort of tie that she has with this particular person, Jean Belfour here, but Jean Belfour has an interesting political history. Um, he has been on board with the Direct Democracy Party, Libertarians, and the PPC, and it says here, the Swiss system of direct democracy is my inspiration for bringing a similar system to Canada. I follow the same governing principles as Maxime Bernier, leader of the People's Party of Canada, but I no longer have faith in the big government reality in which political parties will say and do virtually anything in order to get elected and hold political authority over Canada's nearly 37 million citizens. My goal is to inform as many people as I can of the merits of a decentralized model of, govern of government like the Swiss in which citizens can have much more influence on how they are governed by who and by how much. And again, in theory, that looks good, but through an electronic voting system, that's really easy to get rigged, and I'm pretty sure our computers have been rigged many times over, <laughs> so... Yeah, those, I can't remember the organization offhand that set up the voting machines for some reason. The, the name is not coming to my mind. But, um, yeah, moving forward now. So I'm just going to briefly talk about Policy Horizons here. Um, this Policy Horizons here is something that is working on what is called the biodigital convergence and this is the this is basically what the agenda essentially is what they want to streamline people to because with that direct democracy voting system having to work through a digital system and with technology advancing so fast and with different projects revolving around the Internet of Things, green tech, and that sort of a thing, you have what is called the biodigital convergence. Speed of biodigital convergence in the coming years will depend not only on technological progress but social acceptance. And the pandemic has shown that unexpected events can it trigger rapid shifts than what is widely seen as acceptable or desirable. In the future, we may not see digital technologies and biological systems as separate, but rather woven together, further normalizing the biodigital world that future generations may inherit. Yeah, that's sick, as far as I'm concerned. And I will not be partaking in some kind of system like that, that's for sure. So... Policy Horizons, I just want to go over some of their brief history so that you can see how this organization came to be. And essentially, it is created through the Privy Council. You have, these are all of the members, so it reports through the Deputy Minister of Employment and Social Development Canada to Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion. The Deputy Minister Steering Committee provides oversight, direction, and guidance to the organization. It is co-directed by Jean-Francois Tremblay, Deputy Minister of ESDC, and Michael Vandergrift, Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet, Plans and Consultations, Privy Council Office. And these are its members over here. We see Environment, Climate Change Canada, Justice Canada, Polytechnique Montreal, Indigenous Services and Federal Economic Deve uh, Development Agency for Northern Ontario. So that, so FedNOR is what that is, the Federal Economic Development Agency, where Canada actually has seven regional development agencies that all work on green tech like projects and that sort of a thing. And so that's just Northern Ontario. And then these are some of the members here. And basically, 
so this organization was created in 96, but, um, or sorry, the Policy Research Secretariat, which was later renamed the Policy Research Initiative, was created by the Privy Council Office, and it was a think tank, and it's described here that it focused on horizontal issues that cut across traditional department responsibilities. It sounds more like they were trying to avoid one, bureaucracy, and to do things discreetly and perhaps even in secret and cut across any of the formal processes that Canada would have or teach you about in a political civics class as far as I'm concerned. And the Policy Research Initiative actually Joanne Many was a part of it, which was the communicate which was the executive or communications director of the PPC. And I had actually questioned Maxine Bernier about her a very long time ago, and Maxine Bernier basically ran away from me. But Joanne Many was working with the Policy Research Initiative and attended different meetings held by different NGOs in order to forward the social economy agenda. And social economy is just the fancy Quebec globalist way of saying Agenda 2030 is all it really is. So, anyway, now I, I want to conclude the video, but I just want to bring up a couple things, and it's that this Quebec convoy, if you will, from November 3rd, 4th, and 5th, are going on at the same time Adrian Thomas has this initiative called the End of the Indian Act Walk. And I think this is an interesting parallel because you have, you or sorry, you had the Million Man March that went on at the exact same time as people were protesting that Métis bill, which is either Bill C-53 or Bill C-35. I, I can't remember offhand, and that's not really a subject that I know too much about. However... I will say it's an interesting parallel to see this convoy happening at the same time. There is another initiative that is focused on the First Nations, if you will, at the exact same time. So, and as well, something that is interesting to Norman Blanchfield, one of the figurehead leaders of this Quebec convoy, if you will, um, he seems to be talking about land grabs or Quebec selling portions of land or technology or something to different U.S. corporations. And Adrian Thomas has talked about something similar. So I think Adrian would probably be more approachable than Norman Blanchfield in my view. So if you're watching this, Adrian, I'll probably end up messaging you and asking you what you meant by this land grab or what was going on and uh, see if you could point me in the right direction there. As it seems like you and Norman Blanchfield are talking about something similar, yet I know you two seem to disagree on quite a bit, at least what appears at face value. So, anyway, also, I just want to say, too, that Adrian, at some point, he had some, we'll say, very harsh words for... For Adrian, uh, Adrian had some harsh words for both Norman Blanchfield and Gordon, and he claimed to have exposed the plan, if you will. You can watch my previous videos to see what I mean. He exposed the plan prior to apparently V4F, Veterans for Freedom, so, um, bringing up the plan. And so, basically, Adrian was saying, and I do have to agree, that their so-called plan will actually bring the Emergency Act in, which, yeah... And possibly even worse. So yeah, I am inclined to agree with that. And all in all, I just want to say to everybody, just use your discretion. And if you have any comments, questions, or whatever the case may be, feel free to message me on Facebook at Matt Unseated or write in the comments section below. And yeah, that's basically how you can get a hold of me. And there's anything anybody wants to add feel free so thanks for watching everyone.